So for a while um, in my youth, I went to school in the States, and when I would tell someone I was from Canada, they'd say, oh, do you know my cousin in Vancouver? <laughs> and I'd say, no. So here's a weird Canadian publishing story. Clive Thompson, who's from Canada, but lives in New York now and is a big, fancy New York Times writer, right? right? We actually overlapped at the League of Canadian Poets for five minutes once. We worked at the same place in Toronto because Canada is actually that small. <laughs> um, Clive Thompson is our next speaker. He's gonna, he has a talk called Coders, the Making of a New Tribe and Remaking the World. He is a longtime contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and a columnist for Wired. He is the author of Smarter Than You Think, which is an excellent book. I recommend you find that and read it. Um, whose subtitle is How Techni Technology is Changing Our Minds for the Better. Clive. Um, I've been, I've been, I've been in, in, in the U.S. for 20 years now, um, and I have the exact same thing happen, where as soon as you meet anyone and they know you're from Canada, they're like, oh, do you know Suzanne from Edmonton? And then, you know, I launch into my, you know, my, my, you know, angry tirade about, no, it's a separate country, it's a great big country, it's like, you know, millions of people, you know, like, it's, it's much bigger than, you know, you, you, or you think it's just this tiny little thing, and then after my five-minute harangue, they're like, so do you know, you know, uh, this woman in Edmonton? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I actually, <laughs> it turns out I actually do know her, she's a sister of someone I went to a college with. Uh, it's humiliating beyond description. Um, that's the first joke I'm starting with. The second one is that, so I dressed, you know, to try and look vaguely official, you know, when I came here. Then I walk in and I realize, this is just a, a room full of goddamn nerds, right? I could have worn anything I wanted. Um, in fact, I could have worn the t-shirt I was wearing this morning, which I got at an O'Reilly conference uh, for the band called Sons of Fortran. Uh, 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 okay? There's a great story behind the, behind the name of this, this band. I, I met this dude at, a, uh, at an O'Reilly conference, um, and he was wearing a t-shirt, and I'm like, oh my god, I want one of these. He's like, I have a box. It's our band. What happened was that when he moved into this building, in, uh, in Silicon Valley, and he went into the garage and he discovered this dusty old drum set. And it turns out, it transpired that he had moved in to a building that back in the 60s and late 50s was owned by one of the guys that was on the committee developing Fortran. Um, and back then, this guy had a teenage son who decided that he wanted to be a rock star. Uh, and he bugged his dad to buy him a drum kit, and so he set up a surf rock band and played that for a little while. And eventually they sold the house and moved on, but for whatever reason, over the next few owners, they never got rid of the drum kit. Uh, and so this guy, who moved into this house, dusted it off and started learning to play the drums, and after about two years, started a band and decided to call it Sons of Fortran, uh, since it's actually based on the drum kit from the son of the guy that made Fortran. All right, my jokes are over. Now it's time to actually have a real talk. So this is my next book. Uh, it's coming out in about a week. You are the first people on the planet to hear about it, hear a talk about it. Um, it's Coders, the Making of a New Tribe and the Remaking of, of the World. And um, basically, I got very interested in the role of computer programmers in everyday life, uh, partly because I'm a programmer from way back myself. I learned BASIC and Fortran back in the 70s and 80s. I didn't go into it. I became a journalist. But I kept on being fascinated by it such that I write all day long about the effect of technology on everyday life. And I decided that like most of the world has no idea what programmers do all day long, uh, what, their, what their priorities are, how they see the world, even though the way they see the world is having more and more effect on everyday life. And I, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of those effects are. Um, I'm going to begin with a, a story of, th this is the story that opens up my book, actually. It's about uh, some what I consider to be one of the most consequential software updates of the 20th century, which is the 21st century now, which is the introduction of the Facebook newsfeed. All right, so it's, al it's almost hard to imagine now, remember, what Facebook was like before the newsfeed came along. Um, is anyone here actually using it back in like 2006, 2007? Hands up. Okay. So you guys will remember that it looked like this, right? It was just like a bunch of pages, you know? You had to go in and update your own page, and your friends were updating their pages. And if you wanted to see what your friends were doing, you had to go and remember to actually look at their page, you know? And they had to remember to go and look at yours. It was actually incredibly inefficient in a certain extent. It was like living in a, you know, a big apartment building where you had to knock on everyone's door and poke your head inside to find out what they were up to. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, you know, liked the fact that people were swarming to Facebook, but he wanted, he sort of recognized this was an inefficient way to, uh, a very slow way to check on what people were doing, and he wanted to speed it up. He wanted to, he wanted to accelerate it, you know? Um, and so he was, 
this was in keeping with his own ethos, which was, you know, do things quickly, you know, move fast and break things, you know, change things around. And so even though Facebook was very successful, he wanted to fundamentally change the way it worked. And he had this idea. He was always carrying around this little notebook and writing in this, like, three-point font that he, like, uh, he writes in. Um, and he'd been sketching out for some time the idea that there should be this, um, this almost, like, daily newspaper that came to you in Facebook. That's the way he described it to himself and to his staff that there was going to be this customized collection of all the stuff that people were post posting on Facebook, all the people you cared about, it would just come to you, you know, in this sort of, in, in this one gazette, like a 18th or 19th century gazette about the, the doings of your friends. Um, now, back then, it was actually, is almost, again, almost hard to remember, but Facebook was so small, uh, and everyone was convinced that social media was just a flash in the pan. He had trouble hiring developers. You know, there were about 15 people, and none of the serious developers in Silicon Valley would come and work for him. This is one person who would. This is Ruchi Sangvi. So she uh, she had actually just come out of uh, uh, out of uh, uh, school for computer science, and she'd originally taken a job at a bank in New York, and she showed up for their first day of work and gazed at this enormous floor of gray cubicles and people doing incredibly dull work for the quants. And she was like, I can't do this. I, I can't do this with my life. You know, she, wanted to, she wanted to make things. She wanted to ship products that people were going to use. And so she, she, she quit. She literally left on the first day, hopped on a plane, went to Silicon Valley, and went to work for Oracle doing database work. She still didn't like it that much. She wanted something that was more exciting. And one day, a friend of hers dragged her by Facebook. And this was like, you know, back when it was 16 people, and it was above a Chinese food store. And they had like graffiti everywhere and a, you know, a beer keg, and like they were sitting around playing video games and writing code on the roof in the sun. And she thought, this looks like fun, you know. Um, and so they, it, was, it, was, it was a useful moment because they're looking for anyone who'll work for them as a developer, and she's looking for a job, this type of thing. So she became their first female developer, and... Uh, and she was set to work trying to create the news feed and make it happen, right? She was part of a four-person group, and Zuckerberg said, I want this news feed, you know, make it happen, go. So for about nine months, she and that team sat down, and they prototyped, and they prototyped, and they, and they worked on different ideas. And uh, finally, at around nine months, they actually had something that they, they all liked. They had demoed it internally, you know, they could see this nice stream of, of updates, and they thought, okay, it's finally come time. Zuckerberg liked it. He approved it, gave it a thumbs up, and uh, I believe it was the 6th, someday, I'm forgetting, but someday in August 2006, they turned it on. Uh, around midnight, actually, or sometime a little after, they had been working all day on it. They got some champagne, they got bottles of champagne, because they were like, this is the big moment we transform how Facebook works. They thought everyone was just gonna love it, so they popped the bubbly, pushed it out, and then sat there watching the response from people. Everyone hated it. Like, literally everyone in the newsfeed itself was going, this is awful, what the hell happened? Turn this off, this is too much information. Uh, they, they, they were just completely crestfallen. Like, they had created something that no one liked. And, you know, why did, why did everyone dislike it? You know, well, they had completely changed the way Facebook's attentional apparatus worked from a, from a pull mode to a push mode, right? And everyone started feeling that, you know, they were too exposed. You know, if, it used to be if you changed something in your page, it took a little while for other people to find it out. Maybe you could revert before anyone knew. Um, now, the slightest change in your relationship status, everyone was immediately talking about it, you know. And so within 24 hours, something on the order of 10% of their entire user base had joined a group saying, turn off the news feed, right? Um, and there was other groups uh, uh, devoted specifically to hectoring Ruchi Sangvi. Uh, and within, by the second day, 48 hours, there was actually groups, phalanxes of, of students parked on the front lawn of Facebook waving signs to turn off the news feed, such that you know, Zuckerberg and all the other developers like Sangvi had to sneak in the back door for two or three days because they were trying to avoid this angry mob with pitchforks. All right, so what were they going to do about it, right? You know, like they've, they've spent months on this thing. It's supposed to be core to how the, how the, the system works. There were two camps. Half the developers were like, all right, we screwed this up. We, we got to turn this thing off or it's going to kill the company. The other half, led by Zuckerberg and Rucci, were like, no, no, we think that actually people will get used to this. It feels like a dramatic acceleration of the experience, but they will sort of catch up with it. They'll actually start to like it. And this is actually something I, I, Zuckerberg, uh, uh, I spoke to him in 2008, about two years after this, and he said, I remember him telling me, you know, I had an intuition that if people, it was going to be shocking 
to have this sudden spray of information, but if people just got used to it, they would start to enjoy it. All right. So they made the gamble to leave it on. And lo and behold, he was right. You know, over the next couple of years, over, really over the next couple of weeks, actually, people started deciding that they actually kind of liked this accelerated, more efficient Facebook, where like, stuff came at them much more rapidly. They sort of, they, they realized, sociologists and psychologists later described it to me as what they call ambient awareness, which is sort of, you know, you're, you're a way of sort of having a free-floating knowledge of what's going on in the world around you. You know, people were sort of enjoying the fact that they could now consume more rapidly more and more and more information about their friends. You know, here's a photo of them at a party. Here's an update, you know, about their mood. Here's a link to a story. Here's a link to the same story. Oh my God, my friends are reading the same story. It became a different, almost ESP-like connection to the world. So people really started to like it. And this is sort of what, what, what Zuckerberg had more or less hoped would happen. It did happen. Uh, and so the, face, the Facebook's newsfeed became central to the, to the ecosystem and the much more rapid metabolism of that site, right? He had dramatically torqued its speed. Now, uh, they, they did also have to start, though, changing a lot of what that meant about what Facebook was. That was the beginnings of filtering, using algorithmic filtering to figure out what people should be looking at. Because back when they, when they first turned the, the newsfeed on, there was about... The average user, if they looked at everything all their friends were doing, it would have been about 2,000 posts a day. And that's way too many. Like, they wanted to get it down to about 200 posts a day. So you're having to you know, filter for you know, what you can imagine would be the most interesting or the most sort of quote unquote engaging. At the same time as you're building an ad model where they want to get as many eyeballs as possible on the newsfeed. So you know, this was the beginnings of the situation that we, have, we now sort of see emerged with, with the newsfeed, where like they're, they're increasingly using trained machine learning models to sort of intuit, well, what is it that people tend to click on most when it goes by in the newsfeed? You know, well, we'll do more of that. Let's lean more into that. And what eventually started to happen, you know, slowly at first and then more rapidly, was that all those algorithms began to settle on, you know, ex essentially <laughs> extreme emotionality, right? You know, anything that was button pushing, anything that made you laugh really hard, anything that made you cry, anything that made you yell and go, that's wrong, anything that made you angry, that is what tended to be rewarded with the clicks in the feed. That's what tended to get reinforced. That's what the algorithms moved towards. And of course, you know, with the beauty of hindsight, we can now see that this caused all sorts of problems a few years later, right? You know, when, when the postmortems were done on, on news feeds effect on the 2016 electoral cycle, it was clear that crazy conspiracy theories found an absolutely fantastic vector to get into society via the news feed, because once you've got you know, a central attention span for the United States of America and indeed for the entire world. Um, and once you've essentially taught the algorithms running it that to deal with this massive volume, they have to focus on the most extreme stuff, the people who have crazy conspiracy theories realize this is an amazing place to go and send our cons crazy conspiracy theories into the world. You've got Pizzagate, which is a crazy conspiracy theory arguing that Hillary Clinton and her associates were holding a... Um, a child slavery ring in the basement of a, of a DC pizzeria. Um, you can sort of laugh about it, but you know, after about a year of that, someone walked in with a gun to investigate uh, this pizzeria. No one was hurt, but it could have happened, right? So what started happening was, you know, by creating this extremely high throughput, highly torqued single failure point for the American attention span, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and the people had inadvertently created an amazing vector if you wanted to hijack the national attention span and seed stuff in there. And this is, again, exactly what, you know, uh, by all accounts of the security agencies of several countries, Russia did during that election. They realized that they could actually use a, use a news feed quite, quite easily to inject hysterical material that would try and get Americans pissed off at each other. You know, like posts that would say, you know, uh, uh, this candidate is awful, this candidate is terrific. You know, this issue is awful, this issue is terrific. Anything so long as it was extreme on either side uh, of the case and to get people arguing. And so one of the things that is so fascinating to me as I talk to all the people, uh, the, all the developers and designers and coders that built social media, you know, and, and I've been sort of talking to them on and off really since the early aughts when they built this stuff, is that they, they went into it, you know, very... Um, you know, very naive and very optimistic that they were doing this, the, the, this task of taking an inefficient, 
form of communication and making it far more efficient, making it easier for people to post and share things, making it easier for people to see the things that other people had shared. It was enormously fun. It is really not that much fun for them anymore. Like they're getting dragged in front of Congress and asked you know, to account for how these systems have begun to affect society. Uh, um, in fact, actually right after, right after all this stuff started to hit the fan, uh, in 2000, late, late 2017, Zuckerberg actually posted this 5,000 word essay trying to explain what he thought he was doing now with Facebook's newsfeed. Um, and it has this fascinating phrase where he basically reframes Facebook's mission as, you know, connecting the world, you know, which is what he's always doing, while mitigating areas where technology and social media can contribute to divisiveness and isolation. And I read that and I thought, wow, that's quite a step down from move fast and break things, right, you know? Like he's clearly on some level, uh, even if he doesn't act on it very much yet, understood that, he, that uh, all the code that he uh, and his gang pushed into the world has had effects that he never intended, right? Um, so this is sort of one of the reasons why I wanted to write a book about the people who write software and the effects it has because in many ways, like, it reminds me of, of previous waves we've had in society where certain professional classes become incredibly catalytic and important, right? You know, so you think back a couple hundred years ago to the origins of revolutionary America, right? You know, they were creating a new society that was going to be based entirely on rules written down on paper. And so the people who had power back then were the people who were either lawyers or had legal training, you know? They could write the code that was gonna become the United States. If you wanted to have a seat at the table, that's the, la the, the language you had to speak, you know? All those guys that were figuring out, you know, that were writing the Federalist Papers, that were writing the Constitution, that were writing the Declaration of Independence, they were all lawyers or trained in lawyerly thinking, you know? And, and, and we're still living, you know, in the United States uh, um, with the effects of that, you know, hundreds of years later. The, des the design decisions they made still resonate. You know, the, the, um, the Electoral College, which was this sort of, you know, kind of crazy way to hand a lot of power to rural states to try and keep them from leaving, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the country, that is still a design decision that everyone is wrestling with right now as the United States urbanizes and they lose electoral power compared to these sparsely populated rural areas, you know. So, so that, that was one cohort of people that had a lot of power you know, at, a, at a point in time and made decisions that, that linger. You know, 100 years later, you saw the same thing with urbanization, right? You know? So like, as the industrial period really you know, kicks into high steam in the 19th century and people start crowding into cities, you know, all around the globe, big cities suddenly have to grapple with how are we going to have millions of people live next to each other without you know, dying of crime, drowning in their own excrement, and being able to physically move around. So suddenly, one of the powerful occupations becomes that of the urban planner and the people that organize and design cities. Where are you going to lay the roads? Where are you going to lay the sidewalks? Where are you going to lay the subway tunnels if you have them? Where are you going to lay the overpasses? This is Robert Moses, right? So down in New York, uh, in the 20th century, he was often called the master builder because he had so much power that pretty much anything he wanted to do to the, to the superstructure of, of New York, he got green-lighted, you know? So, for example, you know, he was, um, he was, he was thinking about the shape of, of the northern part of New York. Um, you have the two, a highway going up either side of the Bronx, and it's very hard to get from one side to the other because it's just this warren of small, small little, little uh, streets. So he goes, okay, we're building an expressway. Cross Bronx Expressway. We're just going to cut right through and in a few years and just make it happen. Uh, and so he pushes out that update. And sure enough, it works, right? Like you, have, you suddenly have this ex extremely fast path for truck traffic to get from one side of New York to the other. It's fantastic for commerce. It is terrible for the people of the Bronx. Um, he single-handedly destroyed the, uh, the, 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 the wealth of thousands of mostly middle class and now lower lower middle class to working class blacks because their houses were now next to this, this very you know, quickly thrown up um, overpass that's belching pollution uh, into the area and just making it completely unpleasant. Like that's decades of, of, uh, of, uh, of human toll that goes on and on from this one structural decision. And he did that over and over again. You can, you know, I live in New York City and like I'm frequently uh, living under essentially the designs that were laid down by this guy decades ago. So, you know, you have people that are lawyers 200 years ago, you have, you know, urban planners 100 to 50 years ago, and today you have, you know, the people that design and implement and put out software. Software is becoming increasingly 
uh, the fulcrum point by which we determine the rules that we do things all day long, you know, how we work, how we play. Um, and so this is what makes the, the sort of the, the proclivities, I guess, and, and the passions and the, the worldview of people that make software of great interest to me. Uh, and I've spent years and years and years, you know, I'm friends with a lot of developers. Uh, um, I, I, I've, I've watched them do things. I've talked to them about what they're trying to do. And so what I try to do with this book is to sit down with like a lot of people and, say, and get them to tell me, so, you know, so what, you know, what is it that you think you see about your discipline and the way it architects your thinking that has an effect? And one of the things that, that you know, everyone told me is that, you know, when you're a developer, you, you either start this way or very much become this way, obsessed with speed and efficiency, right? Because to a certain extent, all engineering throughout history has always been very much concerned with accelerating a process, taking something that's slow and just torquing it up a little bit better. You know? that, goes, that goes all the way back to mechanical engineering. You know, it goes certainly back to Taylorism, Frederick Winslow Taylor, in the early, in the early 20th century, in the late 19th century. He, he was looking at the way you know, factories were working, and he, he saw that people were you know, doing these repetitive motions. You had 10 people all doing a repetitive motion. He's like, no, 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 no. We should break that into a bunch of little motions. Each person does just one motion. Everything will speed up. And you know, it absolutely worked. You know, he created a way of architecting a factory floor that had much higher throughput and much higher efficiency. It was sometimes rather miserable for the human workers, right? You know? But the goal was to speed things up, industrial efficiency. One of the things that a lot of, a lot of software developers told me, um, and, I've, and I know this myself from, I think I can get this running. Yes, it's, a, it's an animated GIF. Um, is, uh, is that they, when, you when, you, when, you're working with, with, when you're working with software and when you, can, when you can write software and scripts yourself, you very quickly start noticing any sort of repeated behavior around you and wanting to get rid of it, wanting to get the machine to do it for you, right? You know? uh, very frequently, I heard from a lot of developers who discover this in their teenage years when they're forced to do math homework. And they get sick of having to say, show your work over and over and over again. So I would say like a dozen programmers at Google and all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of other places would tell me of the exact same story of realizing, all right, I'm just going to write a script that like, takes the equation, breaks it down, outputs the, the steps, and I'm done, basically, uh, over and over. I heard that story so many times, it's clearly some sort of like teen trauma. I'm seeing people literally smiling in the audience. You guys have done it too, right? Of course you have, exactly. And so uh, over and over again, uh, I, would, I would hear about the fact that because you're working with a machine that is very good at being precise, and humans are not precise, and very good at doing things repetitively without getting bored, which again, humans are not good at doing, there's this instinct to always want to see something that's being repetitive uh, or inefficient and, 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 and just go in there and automate it, you know? And, and I began to realize it's almost like an aesthetic, right? It's something you can't turn off. Like, like developers look at inefficiency and they recoil the way someone else would recoil from like, you know, a bunch of rotting meat or something like that. Like, why is that there? That's gross, let's get rid of that, you know? Um, it, it becomes almost a sort of a, a spiritual uh, disposition. And of course, you know, like, this is really good for most of society, right? You know, like, we, we, we've had enormous upsides given to us by the fact that you have all these developers who are constantly, you know, worrying away at how to take something that's being done badly and make it, make it happen more quickly. You know, almost all the software we use, more or less, is an optimization of a previously unoptimized activity, right? You know, Microsoft Word is a way to more optimally create documents without having to do all the scut work that you had to do back with typewriters, which I'm old enough to remember having done. It was terrible. Like, the world is much better right now, right? You know, um, you know or you know, WhatsApp is a, is, a, is a much more optimal way to stay in contact with far-flung families. You know, you can go on and on and on. The optimizations are enormously enormously useful. But they also, of course, you know, I think we're increasingly seeing have a lot of side effects, you know? Like Uber was, in many ways, an absolutely brilliant optimization ploy, right? You know, the developers, <coughs> the developers for U Uber looked at the world and said, well, we have an information desert here. You know, the drivers don't know where the riders are, and the riders don't know where the drivers are, you know? And we can solve that now. Everyone's carrying a location device in their pocket, and everyone's got a com computer in their pocket, so we can just, you know, algorithmically sort that out. And lo and behold, it works incredibly well, you know? For users like me, it works incredibly well. It's fantastic. I get a car now in one hour. For the drivers, it hasn't been so good, right? You know, Uber has sort of created a 
much huger market with way more cars on the road to the point where there's so much competition that it's actually really quite hard to make a decent living uh, being a driver. This has had significant effects, particularly for immigrant communities in most major cities, because one of the ways that you sort of got into the middle class was be by becoming a driver and making a reasonable living so that your kids could go on to college and do something else, and that is, that, that is essentially closing shut. You know? Again, very good for me, great optimization for me, but a lot of catastrophic side effects at the edges. Even weird little pieces of software that you wouldn't expect to have side effects, you know, wind up having side effects when you look at, their, uh, at what they optimize. One of the favorite stories I ran into was the creation of the like button. So the like button was an optimization play. Um, the designer Leah Perlman uh, and, uh, and the programmer um, Justin Rosenstein, I think his last name is, were working at Facebook. And they were realizing that, you know, whenever someone posted something people liked, you know, you'd get some comments beneath it, like, hey, you know, Clive, great photo, you know, terrific picture. Um, but the truth is, it takes a bit of effort to write a little comment saying, hey, you know, nice post, great, you know, like, great picture. Uh, and they suspected there was a, a latent um, positivity that was not getting expressed because most people didn't want to be bothered to write a comment. And so they theorized that if you could make it just one button click easy, you would unlock a bunch of positive responses, right? And so they originally just, they, 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 you know, they did a typical thing. They did their 24-hour hackathon. They came up with like a, a concept. It was originally called the awesome button. Uh, uh, um, just imagine how different, you know, our, our modern language would be if, if instead of like it was called awesome. Um, and they presented it to Zuckerberg, and Zuckerberg was kind of a little wary of it, but eventually he, green, he greenlit it. They called it, moved it from awesome to like, and they pu pushed it out online. And lo and behold, it did exactly what they thought it would do, right? You know, it, it created this explosion of an easy way to say, hey, that's a great, yeah, that was great, I like that. And people started liking like crazy. It's been like 1.5 trillion likes up until today. It's been one of the most consistently used features in Facebook because it took something that was hard to do to show approval and made it really quick and easy. But again, it started to actually have these weird side effects that the designers of the like button themselves began to regret as time went on. One of the things was that they didn't anticipate was that once you had a number next to the like, people would become kind of obsessed with that quantification, right? You know, like normally they would post something and then they would, you know, go back and go work at something else for maybe 15 minutes, look back and see whether anyone had commented. Now, because there's a number, they would just be sitting there refreshing, refreshing, refreshing the page, waiting to see if that number would go up at all. Why has why is, why is that other photo got more likes than mine? You know, it, so as th there's, this, there's this entrepreneur who wrote a funny comment in a, in a book. It's our generation's crack cocaine. People are addicted. We experience withdrawals. We are so driven by this drug getting just one hit elicits truly peculiar reactions. I'm talking about likes. And so sure enough, as the years went on, this, it also became a sort of a vector uh, for the problems with the newsfeed overall, with the, the sort of um, the reification of increasingly hysterical or extreme emotionality, because of course that is what attracts the most likes. You know, me saying something sober about the budget doesn't get a lot of, lot of likes. Me saying this politician is terrible and deserves to be dragged to the street gets tons of likes from all the angry people that are angry the way that I'm angry. Um, and so, in fact, actually, years later, the people who designed that, uh, the like button, are now thoroughly disavow it. Uh, um, uh, one of them, I believe, has entirely stopped using Facebook completely. Um, th I mean, this is, this, this is all sort of, you know, latticed around the fact that the world of software is one that is you know, increasingly over time, uh, concerned and obsessed with massive, massive metastatic growth, right? You know, if you are trying to get funding to do something, certainly down in Silicon Valley and in most venture capital backed areas, um, the people who are giving the money are only interested if they're going to see like the hockey stick growth, right? They, they, don't, want, they don't want to see a thousand users, they want to see a million users, they want to see that growing rapidly into the horizon so there's some sort of off ramp where they can sell this thing and make a ton of money. And of course, scale itself you know, causes all sorts of problems, as I think everyone in this room knows. Certainly when you're dealing with social software, scale immediately makes humans irrelevant because you cannot have humans involved in any sort of routine decision making in a system that is moving at the pace of billions of posts a day, right? So once you are pursuing scale, you are also basically seeding decisions over to algorithms. And, put, and, and I should say specifically, as we know these days, you know, often quite complex and even maybe a little ununderstandable machine-trained um, systems. 
So this, is, this has been another thing that a lot of the developers I've talked to are sort of are uneasily wrestling with these days, um, which is that they're, they're sort of increasingly aware that all the problems that you saw with the newsfeed are cropping up over and over and over again as, as the sort of desire to create more and more high throughput, highly efficient systems with, that scale quickly wind up running into exactly the same problems. This is a great little post I just saw the other day on Twitter. Uh, this is um, Rich Hickey. He is a Clojure programmer. Um, Clojure is a very kind of cool, chill community. If you ever programmed it and talked to the people in it, they're all like a nice bunch that really, uh, really support each other. And so uh, he, he bought a new computer, and the first thing he did with it when he opened it up was to look at some YouTube Clojure videos, right? So the only data that YouTube has about, about this, this new user with this entirely new computer is you know, geographically where it is. It might, they might be hazarding some guesses about his identity, basically. Uh, they might know that he's a, he's a guy if he's put his name into it. But other than that, the only thing they know is that he's looking for closure videos. It immediately began recommending like red pill misogynist videos, uh, um, stuff about Jews and intelligence. And there's other ones you can't see here that, that go further on down that indicate that at least one third of these recommendations were just these sort of far right <laughs> Uh, um, far right conspiracy theories and stuff, and he's like, "Why are they? Why? Why do they think that I would want this? Is it just because I'm a guy that is a programmer? You know, like, are, is this how reductive their system has become? Uh, that they basically regard any sort of you know white dude who's into programming as as a possible." A convert to far-right conspiracy theories. Um, so, oh, like, I've 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 noticed a, a great uptick in concern in developers all across the country and in Silicon Valley. But what are the side effects of these high-throughput systems that they're that they're producing? One of the things some of them are beginning to wonder, although this one is an awfully hard thing to answer, is you know, are there ways to slow down the systems? You know, to be able to sort of think a little less about always making things higher throughput and, and more efficient, and maybe think a little bit more about what the design goals of the system really ought to be, you know? There's not a lot of examples of that type of design thinking, right? Because it goes against the grain for the very reason that we think we use code to speed things up. You know, one, one interesting example is um, Nextdoor. So uh, Nextdoor is one of these sites that's like a hyper-local site for meeting and talking to your neighbors online. So if you lived in Cabbage Town, uh, you could set up the Cabbage Town next door community, and anyone who lived in Cabbage Town could join, so long as they can prove they physically li live there. Like you have to get a piece of mail with a code sent to your house, right? But once you've joined, you know now you can talk to all your Cabbage Town neighbors, and you know it's actually been a very successful little company because there's a lot of things it's useful for, like you know, can I borrow this tool board, you know, or like information about local schools or whatnot. But they're also became a problem with crime reporting because they put sort of a neighborhood watch tool in there. Like one of those things where if you saw a crime, you could report it so your neighbors you know, would know about it. But what started happening was that in a lot of communities, uh, you would get these very hasty race reactions. Whenever any person of color walked through, like say a majority white neighborhood, someone would get online and go, oh my God, you know, a stranger just walked through the neighborhood. You know, watch out. Um, and this really began happening so frequently that uh, the CEO was getting called out about it on national TV. And so he eventually said, okay, we have to, we have to, we have to deal with this. We've, we've made it so easy and quick for people to react based on their hunches. We have to figure out a way to slow that down. And so that's what he did. He got together, he hired a designer uh, from, uh, from Amazon who worked on a, uh, on a different reporting system that was, that was premised on, on the idea that they should actually encourage people to slow down and, and, and require them to offer up more information before they can make a post about a supposedly criminal activity they've seen. Like, they, like unless you can answer these questions, like what was there, you know, a hat, someone wearing a hat, what did their hair look like? What was their height roughly? What can you describe their shirt? Can you describe their shoes? So that it was, it was forcing people to, to, to interrogate themselves, do I have any information about this person, you know, or am I just reacting to the color of their skin? And lo and behold, the report, the racist reports dropped by 75% over the next month that they put this thing out. And some of it was probably just that the people didn't have any information. They couldn't fill this form out. But there was hopefully, you know, maybe a minority of them who also realized that they were making some weird snap judgment. Either way, it was a very useful intervention that, go, again, goes against the grain of making things happen quickly, 
saying, well, why don't we try and architect a system that actively asks people to think, right? So there are interesting ways to do this, and, and, there's, and I'm seeing more and more of a conversation uh, of developers and designers thinking a little bit about what are the priors that they bring to design. Um, I'm going to sort of move towards the end of this talk by throwing it out to the, to the uh, um, issue of books, uh, because, you know, the truth is I don't know the book industry, you guys do, but I'm kind of interested to think a little bit about, you know, are there ways in which the pursuit of efficiency um, has been a problem in the industry at all, you know? Uh, I can think of one funny example, which is that about five or six years ago, I, uh, I had a lot of people approaching me as a reporter and saying, hey, I've, I've created this, um, this system for letting people do social annotation in books. And you guys probably remember the Vogue for this too. It was about five or six years ago, a bunch of demos coming out. And the idea was that we were gonna create books that let readers have conversations in the margins of the books, you know, and like talk to each other, talk to the author. Um, we're gonna take all the stuff that's happening in this very slow way outside the book in, in everything from discussions on Goodreads or in review comments and bring them inside the book itself. They're all in one place. And of course, you know, uh, I, I, I'm I, you know, a nerd, and I'm a book person, and, I'm, and uh, so I said, yeah, sure, show me these things, and I thought they looked kind of interesting. I wasn't sure if they would go very far, but it turns out every single time they introduced one of these systems, everyone hated it, right? Like, you know, or most of the people hated it. The authors loathed the idea. The, the last thing they wanted was to make it easier for randos to leave comments in the corner, uh, the, the corner pages of their books. Like, they were like, not on... You know, not on my watch. You are not rolling a software out inside my book. Publishers had the same concerns about it. Um, you know, weirdos like me were sort of interested in the idea, and I actually I gave a chunk of my last book to be put inside one of these systems and sort of sat there and kind of, act, I, had, I, I admit I had kind of a good time, I, you know, but I'm probably a limit case in this regard. That was, and that, that struck me as a fascinating example of like someone wanting to do one of these hyper-accelerated things that just completely fell flat because it did not actually serve the, the needs of a lot of the core stakeholders. You know? DRM is an example of using code to slow things down in a way that I think is disastrous and I don't like. You know? So even as an author and certainly as a reader, you know, I understand why DRM on books is there, but it fundamentally breaks for me the experience of actually having a book. You know, I cannot lend it very easily to someone else. I cannot give it to someone else. Uh, I cannot put it out on the street in a box uh, the way that I do with my other books so that you know, I, I can sort of participate in the community recycling and upcycling of books. I understand, again, why it's there, but it's actually an example of where I would like to see books almost be a little bit more frictionless and more efficient so that they can actually move from person to person with the speed and elegance that paper books do. I would love to see better thinking on that, on that problem, right? Anyway, the long, I'll leave it here because we can have a little bit of time if anyone has any, any thoughts or ideas or responses, I'd love to hear them. But basically, that's the gist of what my book is about. It's, it's an attempt to, by profiling tons and tons of developers, think a little bit about what their priors are, you know, what their worldview is, and how that enacts itself out on the world. That is the book, Coders, and it's coming out next week. Uh, so you guys can help me out by pre-ordering it right now on the, on the computer inside your phone because you know how valuable pre-orders are for authors. Uh, um, there is no audience I'm going to talk to about this book that understands that better than the people inside this room. Thank you very much for your attention. So, I don't know, does anyone want to want to reflect or have any questions or thoughts? Sometimes, I, I hate when they say questions because sometimes I feel like just get up and say a crazy manifesto. It doesn't have to be a question. Do whatever you want, basically. Okay. And hi I'm there. Stalk you right after, so you can sign yeah. my. Work. Absolutely, <laughs> you got um, it. I wanted to quickly ask: Do did the people you interview talk about regret? Regret on the work that that they've done that may have had negative impacts, and what kind of sure. insights did you glean from? Yeah. Those those um, reflections. Yeah. Um, uh, several have, absolutely. Uh, um, uh, one of my favorite regret stories, um, and you can actually see his, his video because he's done a speech about it, is um, Ethan Zuckerberg who invented the pop-up ad. Uh, um, he, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, like he's, he, he's, he's occasionally tried to calculate, literally at the level of electricity usage, how much damage he's done to the planet, you know? Uh, um, and it was, and it was, it, it, he was working for an ad agency. He was young. They wanted some way to display an ad, and it, it, it wasn't going to be possible in the existing thing. And he thought, well, you know, I think I could use some of these new standards that have just come out for browsers to be able to pop up a related window. And he invents it, and before you know it, it's like kudzu, and it's just taken, it's, or like, you know, um, 
What's that, what's, what's that, what, what's that, 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 that form of muscle that's like essentially destroying all life forms in, in the... Zebra. zebra muscles, yeah, it's a zebra muscle of like a browser code, right? So, you know, he felt straightforwardly bad about that. He's like, I introduced a terrible idea because I was trying to solve a, a problem and I didn't think about the way it could be misused. Um, and so he's arguably spent the rest of his career fighting for civic uses of code to atone for that. Um, and I, but, I, but, I, I, but I also hear, in a weird way, I, I hear also um, a lot of younger coders now who I think maybe have seen the hazards of software that goes out and has side effects. They are, uh, they're, they're becoming really interestingly active almost in a coordinated labor way. Like if you take a look at Microsoft and Google, they both had like staff walkouts on the developer side over, over uh, learning that, that some of the work the company's doing is gonna serve you know, targeting of, um, of, uh, of people in foreign countries or f down in the US for ICE, which is the immigration service that de deports immigrants. And so they're, they're, they're acting with a, great, a greater sense of moral purpose you know, whether or not you agree with their stand, they, they, are, they are taking ethical and moral stances that you certainly didn't see developers taking 20 years ago. That's very interesting to me. So I wanted to sort of ask about how uh, R&D works into this as well, because right. I feel like especially with a like button, and like I don't, I don't, I haven't read a lot about Facebook and its early beginnings. So yeah. my, my like detailed understanding of what they were doing in that place above, above a pizza place? Yeah, 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 pizza uh, joint, and yeah. what yeah. they decided and how they implemented yeah. it. Um, how does that sort of factor, how have you, have you noticed a pattern? Yeah. How that factors into uh, these decisions to yeah. make yeah. large changes and via code, whether well, that's individual yeah, features? It, it, that, that's, it's, it's a really good point. And like, I think, I think what, I, what, what I've learned um, is that very large and established companies, you know, that have been around the block will have processes in place, uh, uh, more or less, to, uh, um, to sort of uh, use your test carefully before they introduce something so they can begin to, because they're, they're aware that there's going to be some side effects to what's happening and they, they, they would like to nip those in the bud. Um, that said, they won't still necessarily be able to predict what's going to happen in the real world. Like, for example, Microsoft, large company, Lots of, uh, lots of ability to do that testing. They, they thought it'd be fun to release you know, a chatbot called Tay, that basically, uh, um, the, with the idea being that like, it will learn from what people say to it. Well, of course, all the trolls immediately started teaching it racist stuff, and by the end of the day, it was like approvingly quoting uh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, uh, and they pulled the plug on it very quickly, right? You know? But that's an example of like, you know, large company, trying to do something new, uh, clearly user testing, didn't foresee that, right? So the large companies will do user, the, the, the really the, scary, the scariest stuff tends to come out of very small startups that are populated by young people and often very homogenous, i.e. You know, young, young white dudes fresh out of college who, have, who not only don't know what they, who, who not only don't know things but don't know that they don't know things, which is actually worse, um, and are just trying to quote unquote move fast and break things. And lo and, uh, you know, like, like Woe well and behold us when something they make suddenly blows up and gets big, because that's when you're going to have the code that has no one has really thought at all about the implications of that suddenly works its way into everyday life. That doesn't happen very often, right? Like, it, like it doesn't happen very often, you know. Um, but you know, like with Instagram, you know. So Kevin, uh, Kevin Systrom and Mike Krieger, like two people, literally decide that okay, Flickr is an inefficient system. It's like you know, there's a lot of great little little people posting photos, but there's no central place. Let's make a feed, so they make the feed, and that turns, to uh, turns out to unlock a huge amount of photo-taking behavior in a really delightful aesthetic way, you know? There's really great upsides to it, but, you know, it also starts to become a vector for uh, problems in any communities that are wrestling with body dysmorphia, right, you know? They, they spent years wrestling with, um, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, a, 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 you know, co like communities of anorexics uh, that, would, that would use Facebook to sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, further, you know, further messaging that is really a problem for other people that are struggling with anorexia. And this became a real cat and mouse game. Like, nothing that they thought about in the early days when they're just like, oh, let's make these photos happen. Um, so the user testing is a really, is a really big, uh, a big thing. Um, larger companies are better at it than smaller companies. Um, by and large, but even so, um, the real world will surprise you, right? I mean, users will always do things 
I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room knows this. Users will always do things that you could never have predicted. Uh, so I have a couple of teenage daughters. Wait a minute, okay, hold on. I have to tell a story about this guy here. Okay. We were sitting next to each other over there, and, he, and, he, and we're all talking about things, and somehow Amazon Alexa comes up. And he mentions that, oh yeah, I have an Alexa, and I programmed it to like, with a single word, like dim the lights in the house, start play, at bedtime, start playing oh, like a bedtime podcast. Like he literally organized everything in the script, and I, I said to him, I said, are you a developer? Uh, uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm like, I knew it, I knew it. Anyone who's like spent that much time automating a basic process in his life, like that's like the heat signature developer. I can, I can recognize people like that from 10 feet away. All right, carry on, my friend. Let's, no worries. Let's, uh, yeah. So, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> so I have two teenage daughters and uh, my eldest, like they're starting to get into Instagram and then now Snapchat. Right. And this whole thing about streaks and yes. keeping up with them, it's like an obsession where they're taking constantly photos of themselves, you know, and it's like, what did, did you act, address that in the book or? No, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the streaks actually didn't exist before the book was written, unfortunately, right, you know? But I can tell you that, um, that uh, lots of developers have talked about um, being shocked and bitten in the butt by these gamification strategies, right? So Dennis Crowley, uh, who, who created a Foursquare, uh, a check-in software. He eventually invented the check-in. Um, he, for fun, just because he's a bit of a weirdo from New York, decided to put these badges in where if you went to like a bunch of cocktail bars, you got like the swanky cocktail, you know, the, the James Bond badge. If you went to you know, a bunch of, uh, of uh, um, a pizza joint, especially the pizza badge, there was a douchebag badge. Uh, if you went to a bunch of bars that were apparently douchey. And since he never listed what they were, people would literally frantically go to what they thought were terrible bars to get them. The, lo the long and short of it is, I, I talked to him and he was like, in the middle of this, this is about six years ago, and he was like, oh my God, I've, like, I've unleashed a demon. Like, I wake up every morning and there's like a thousand emails. None of them are about the functionality of, 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 of the thing. There are 900, 900 are about these badges that I've created. I've like incentivized weird behavior and it's completely taken off. And I think this is exactly what happened. Now, what I would, what I would, what I would pose it, not having actually talked to the streak people, um, directly, that they intended that to be addictive, right? Like, that, that, that's what they want. Like, that's, this is part of the problem, is that they, they have, the, the, their model is as much, you know, eyes on the app as possible, as to get as many hooks in as possible. It's, they've learned their lessons from watching video game developers, frankly, right? And, and casino makers. And so, they, I, I, I would pose that they're doing that knowing the ethical harms and just saying, screw it, we're doing it anyway. We gotta keep the eyes on the app. That's what I suspect with a, comp a company of that size at this point in time. I doubt they're doing it naively. And on that cheery note, we get to end. Thanks for coming out.